Your the athletic. intrepid audience back here, I have to congratulate you guys for making yeah. it through the Thank whole you. day. Thank you. Thank you very much audience. for sticking around. We audience. appreciate it. Good job. It. <laughs> We're going to bring the beers in here now. <laughs> and of course, we have the camera out there. So <laughs> potentially, we have a lot of virtual uh, viewers, and we'll just pretend that that's true. Um, so I'm Susan Mason. I'm a co-founder of a venture capital firm called Align Partners. And we have four CEOs up here of uh, companies that are very interesting from the standpoint of being uh, platforms for financial transaction aspects. Um, if I can just give you a couple minutes on Align Partners uh, and the theme of the uh, panel that we chose, which is really around capital efficiency. And that would be the reason why we were chosen as the host on this panel is our fund is focused on very capital efficient companies. So our companies tend to raise somewhere in the neighborhood of eight to 10 million in total um, before they look to exit, which means that the founders and the employees tend to own 50 to 75% of the company at the exit. So um, it's a little bit different model than traditional venture capital. And that's why I mention it, because we are so focused on starting lean and staying lean and building out companies. And the topic today for our panel is around capital efficiency for your customer base. And we've got four companies here that represent uh, unique value propositions for those customers and how they can better utilize and deploy capital within their own businesses as well as in their investment strategy. So I'm going to ask each of the um, panelists to give you a short 10-story elevator ride pitch on who they are, and then we'll start talking about the specific questions on the area. So, Harish, why don't you tell, tell us off? Thank you. So I'm a CEO of uh, Mercatus. Uh, we are solving an energy investment problem. There's about $6 trillion over the next uh, 10, 15 years that's coming in to create a transformation of the way our energy is produced. There's a lot of capital sitting on the sideline because they don't have enough data and transparency. And when they do get it and decide to put money in, there's a, too much friction in dealing, doing diligence and underwriting. So we have automated that process for them. Great. Thank you. Um, John, why don't you talk a little bit about yours? Six yeah, I'm John Cowan, co-founder and CEO of Six Fusion. Six Fusion's mission in life is to standardize the unit of measurement for IT consumption. We want to organize the global market for IT infrastructure and sort of bridge the gap between tech and finance. Not that there's ever a gulf between tech and finance in most companies. Um, by, uh, by No, there isn't, actually. Um, uh, just a casual observation about the, uh, the average company. So um, what we're really doing is, uh, by standardizing the unit of measurement, is giving the enterprise um, the capability, the power to tip the balance in their favor in when they're negotiating with vendors, deciding which workload should stay on premise, which workload should go to the cloud, these kinds of things, providing the basis for economic transparency that is missing today. We talk about capital efficiency, the amount of money that's being spent on IT today um, is obviously north of $100 billion in IT infrastructure. Where those workloads end up um, obviously is a, is a big consideration for the CIO's office. And so we help them be more, uh, more capital efficient uh, by understanding their data up front um, on the front end of decision making. Excellent. OK. And Frank, Dean, well, the elevator opens. Yeah, yeah. CEO uh, of MarketX. Basically, the notion is pretty simple. IT hardware is a commodity. Uh, finally, it can trade like one. We're really building, unfortunately, we're in New York right now, but we're building the CME of IT, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. We're the central point of liquidity to basically uh, allow a big bank exchange or really any enterprise the ability of trading in and out of their physical infrastructure. Using price is basically that lever, providing transparency to a really big and fragmented market. Um, we love companies like UCX and like Six Fusion because I think what they really need to do from, a, from an enterprise level is unlock the balance sheet and they could do that based on sort of a mark to market as opposed to a straight line depreciation. So we really add that layer of, of knowledge to be able to allow a big bank who spends you know, a couple billion dollars worth on their IT, the ability of unlocking that and getting, getting to the cloud or getting to other, other, other applications to be able to drive efficiencies in their business. Great, okay, and Adam? Adam Zeck, I'm the CEO and co-founder of UCX, stands for the Universal Compute Exchange. It kind of worked out well that how the how everybody was uh, introduced. Um, UCX, we're an on-demand spot exchange. Uh, our initial benchmark product uh, is trading WAC financial products, which we licensed from Six Fusion uh, back in October of 2011. Uh, so it is the ability to take the consumption of compute processing power and have the ability to understand your cost. So therefore, you have your cost, you have your uh, amount of compute processing power, Therefore, you can have a dollar per WAC level, 
which allows you to go to an open transparent market, UCX, in order to buy and sell your compute resources. So it really kind of walks down the line of, of the product life cycle is, is the way I look at it, because as you understand your consumption and you move from uh, maybe some of your on-premise to looking forward to possibly taking some of those applications that you now know how much you consume with Six Fusions technology, you then look at use Market X to get rid of a lot of your uh, infrastructure. You get 30 cents, 60 secondary cents, market, yeah. secondary market, and then you, at the same time, now you have the ability to go to an open market UCX in order to buy your cloud compute. So it kind of works out how we kind of... Big start. connection between capital efficiency and risk management. That is correct. That's terrific. And the other key things are transparency and simplification. Every one of you are talking about making that transparency capability for the customers and then simplifying the entire process. Totally. So talk a little bit about what's the environment your customers are in today? And Harish, why don't you start us off? Because sure. you're in the energy market and... Well, the, and just a quick tutorial for the group. Energy market investing is no different than when you buy a house or you buy a commercial property and you have to go through a laborious process of giving them a lot of information, a lot of documents, your W-2s, and then at some point you ask they ask you niggly questions on, you know, why didn't you pay your doctor bill three years ago, and can we have your wife's signature here, and then you sign all those docs. Energy investing is the same. It's just a different asset class. So there you go. Now you know about energy investing. But the problem is, is that every energy project generates about 1,000 pages of documents in multiple revisions. You have about 50 people that have to diligence it, and they're living in a world of paper. Mm. And so, fine, if you're doing one project a year, not an issue. Now they're doing 5,000 projects a year with 3,000 people and basically they have a spaghetti ball and where they're working with each other, passing information back and forth. Uh, so it's costing them roughly 10% of their operating profit. Mm, okay. Uh, and Frank, you're about unlocking those resources. Correct. So I bet your customers don't even know what they have in a lot of cases. Um, in most cases, they have no idea, right? Yeah. It's, it, it, it's pretty simple um, across the enterprise market, I think just, just more broadly, everybody's doing a straight line depreciation down to zero on all their capital assets on the IT stack, right? It's, it's just a race to the bottom. How, how quick do we really say this technology is going to become obsolete, right? So it becomes very, very interesting and compelling for someone to know that there's actually a mark to market, you know, of what that real fair market value is worth in, in the market. So what we do is in two and a half years, we've collected $70 billion worth of primary market data. Well, that primary market data then feeds into what the secondary market is. So all of the team really comes from um, the high-frequency trading world. Quants and data scientists, back-end engineers, front-end engineers basically use the algorithms to be able to say, here's where the market is today in the primary. Here's where it's going to move through its life cycle in the secondary. So it's about unlocking the balance sheet. So if, if a big bank has $2 billion worth of spend on their IT, for them to know that they can get 350 to $400 million, it's not choking the throat of some other you know, incumbent vendor. Mm -hmm. It's really about taking their portfolio, their assets, and looking at it in a completely different way. And we give it away for free. Mm -hmm. and, and the cloud just adds complexity to that, right? So uh, you know, our customers are looking at it and saying, look, I, internally I measure by the apple. Amazon Web Services measures by the orange. A Azure measures by the grapefruit. How do I actually make heads or tails of this in order to understand what the economic position is I should have in, in this whole cloud or uh, on-demand world? And, and Adam, your point is you have the ability to basically anonymize the cloud resources and quantify it in units. Exactly. How about the security aspects on that? How do your customers think about that? Well, from well, the way we look at it is, I mean, back to John's point before I go into the security is, it's it's kind of a, a three-step approach. It's the measure, the forecast, and then hedge your your financial risk. Now, from a security standpoint, you know, as an exchange, that really isn't our really concerned, but mm -hmm. it is a challenge in the industry. So what we have been doing is we are uh, bringing partners in that can help uh, solve those questions for the different enterprise organizations and different cloud service providers. So the security, yeah, obviously is an issue, but it's, it's an issue that our partners are help solve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we actually see security as, as an element. It's a qualitative uh, component to the commodity, right? So, you know, we see the emergence of commute, uh, compute network and storage as a unified commodity no different than how we view, say, uh, crude. 
right? You've got Brent, and maybe you've got you know West Texas Intermediate. Both are technically measured by the barrel. I provide the definition of the barrel. Uh, both are technically uh, chemically oil, crude oil, but they have different qualitative properties. So in the in the cloud instance, you have maybe highly secure, um, you know, uh, um, uh, regulated type of businesses that need only can only consume a certain type of commodity. They can't necessarily buy, you know, the off the shelf maybe AWS type of service, uh, self service type of uh, environment. They need a certain definition of the commodity. We're defining those specifications as we go along and trade more and more business. I think just as a follow-up to, to what John's doing, it could be because it's very, very interesting, but it's it's a very, very big tangent to, to what's needed in the environment, right? Transparency is really going to ultimately drive any sort of liquidity in any of the respective markets, right? Um, and to be able to do what John's doing on the WAC side is a really, really interesting and needed thing. What you also need is, back to your point earlier about anonymizing the data. Mm -hmm. If the big bank says, here's what my purchase history is, and now you anonymize that back down to the to a um, part number or a SKU, if you will. You build a price index off that to make mm -hmm. that publicly available. Now you can drive transparency and liquidity, which is really what's required. So any of the other markets are going to all need really the same thing. Dare, dare I say we're like the social network of like yeah. cloud trading? Well, yeah, I, I wouldn't go that far, <laughs> but I would really say that, that transparency is ultimately, or data is really going to unlock liquidity. Yes. And to make that free and available is ultimately going to de-risk a lot of the things that you're talking about. Mm, got it. And Harish, change is hard for customers. I mean, and we'll talk about that. So how do your customers respond to that? I mean, you're reducing a lot of the paperwork. You're, mm. goodness, you must be really streamlining a lot of the aspects. But change very, that's change. Change is very hard. It's, yeah. And when you think about utilities, they're not likely to change very fast. So our sales cycle, our biggest competitors, I don't have pain. But the world is changing for them. Uh, the combination that solar and wind and battery storage the, the electric car, the shared economy, it's really putting them under stress. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a significant amount of change management going on with the utility business. Mm -hmm. I think there's some over 55% of their employees are going to retire in the next five years, which is a knowledge retention issue. Wow. So there's a lot of new management coming in. So they're under attack, much like the music industry is under attack, or cable, or our telephone company. So they're ripe for change. Mm -hmm. But uh, change is hard, and that's where we spend most of our time convincing them that, that underneath their floor is a tremendous amount of, you know, leakage going on in their in their business. Right, right. How about you, John? On change with your customers? Yeah, it, you know, change change is an internal battle inside of the customer environment. On one hand, you've got the you know the the, uh, the modern age uh, cloud first type of application developers inside of large enterprise, and then you've got the legacy. I've been here for 30 years. Infrastructure. I mean, you know, we we. Uh, uh, playfully refer to them as server huggers, yeah, um, right. but um, at the end of the day, you have this you have this dynamic. What Six Fusion is trying to do is play the role of, of um, um, you know agnostically sitting between you know the new age and the legacy type of IT, um, and in so doing, sort of democratize the process, right? So if it is more cost efficient to operate internally, all I'm going to do is help you prove it. I'm not here. I don't have a dog in the fight of whether you use AWS or internal IT. We just want to help provide that C-suite visibility um, into you know, the right execution venues by workload or app or, or container. Mm, interesting. And um, Frank, change? Actually, yours is less, I would think, less of a challenge. Well, it's still a challenge, right? I mean, if, anytime you're dealing with something new and innovative, right, mm -hmm. it's going to be viewed as, where's the risk, right? What am I, what am I missing? Um, the good thing is because we're giving away the data for free and doing an API directly into the biggest of banks and saying, here's your mark to market in, a ch in exchange for order flow, there's a quid pro quo, right? I mean, there's a, you know, get to get. Um, but the reality is, is change, and I think the, the gentleman from IBM had said sort of perfectly, it's, especially in the largest financial services firms, it's that security piece, right, and the regulation piece, right? In both of those things, you're going to have to deal with. In our world, it's all about chain of custody. Mm. It's about moving that physical asset, mm. say, from one facility, one data center, and then rolling it through a neutral exchange and making sure it ends up at another type of data center, right, or another cloud provider that's actually going to be the acquirer, right? That's what they want to know. Because at the end of the day, if you're going to save them $300 million and introduce a whole bunch of other risk, it's not going to fly. Mm -hmm. You have to have that central clearing firm basically underneath that's guaranteeing all aspects of the trade in order to do that. Then you're going to de-risk the, the, any of the, the concerns that the regulations or regulatory pieces would have. Mm -hmm. And so that's n n new innovations and new types of, of commodities that are coming, the transparent data that we, we have is always going to sort of force a pause 
but you have to make sure that you deal with those pieces, right. and we have. Adam, how about, um, who, wh what's the initial kind of beachhead domain that you see in your customers? Is it FinTech? Is it other oh, areas? Absolutely. We, we Utilities? See, I mean, the way we are approaching the market is, you know, we, we talk, and you, you talk about it the same, is we go towards the CFOs mm. and explain that, you know, totally. you currently can hedge every aspect of your balance sheet, except you cannot hedge right now your financial IT expenditures. And having the ability to first understand what you're consuming, understanding the cost of that consumption, and then having the ability to move that into an open market, it allows that to happen, uh, is, is, is very easy for a CFO to ex understand because he's already doing it. Um, so that is our kind of our play in regards to how we are going to enter into the market. That's a I big mean, cha change. Is, change is change, yeah, change yeah. is scary. Mental. And we try. And, I mean, everybody's. Oh, I'm going to be disruptive. I'm going to be crazy disruptive. Okay, great. But that scares some people sometimes. And you need to put it in terms of the way they currently understand how they do their job. And I think by explaining it to them that you know you already hedged this. Now, how about we unlock this portion of your balance sheet and hedge this? They're like, absolutely. And I think the product's life cycle as we see it is evolving because IT, you know, 10 years ago was just like a percentage of revenue. Now it's one of the largest, fastest growing portions of the balance sheet. And it is a big concern by every CFO, CIO, CTO, and everybody's looking at it. And the one, one thing everybody understands, no matter how you speak in IT, marketing, or whatever business unit you're in, everybody understands the dollar. Right, but for the decision-making process then, because IT presumably maybe not be the decision-maker, but they're certainly an influencer on the decision uh, process. Absolutely. Is, um, and they typically don't report into the CFO who has pain. Or, or are, are you seeing that? Uh, we're seeing, I mean, most of the companies that we're talking to, I mean, it is, it is the CFO who is talking directly with the CIO and the CTO, basically mandating that they get a better transparency into what their spend is, how they're spending it, you know, what are they going to do in the future, the forecasting. That is, I mean, that's, that's the conversation we see yeah, that, occurring. That, that's, that's a, I as I said, bridging, bridging the gap between finance and technology. I mean, typically right. these are two groups that don't like working with one another, right. uh, communicating with one another, what have you. Um, and, you know, the, the data that we create, you know, exposes um, uh, the underlying conversation that needs to happen. Once we can help a customer identify that you're wasting, you know, 20, 30 percent of the infrastructure that the hardware guy sold you last year, um, what do you do about that? All right. Mm -hmm. Well, these open markets are what you do about that. Right. I want you to trade that on, tr get rid of that physical infrastructure, and, and trade it on Frank's Exchange, um, and procure your next generation cloud uh, consumption uh, requirements on on UCX. I mean, this is the future of of not just procurement, but how we actually. Um, you know, price the market out. Yeah, I think, Susan, the, the, the interesting thing is you have to appeal to different constituents inside the organization, right? One time, one piece sort of takes center stage, which is about sort of infrastructure and what the IT spend is, right? That's going to be really IT-centric. At the end of the day, you still have to have a budgetary approval to be able to do it. But they've sort of been at odds and been on other, sense of, uh, other sides of the island against one another. When we're trying to make a cohesive, you know, viewpoint to say, look, there may be justification for you to take all those applications and move them to the cloud. Mm -hmm. Why does a balance sheet encumber you from doing that? Unlock that and do what you want to do. Or if there's technological advancements between you know, virtualization and software-defined networking, get out of your legacy infrastructure. In right? our case, we're seeing that um, IT is actually kind of losing control. Mm. Because a cloud-based solution... Is it losing power or losing, losing control power of the in inside of the organization? Inside the organization, because a cloud-based solution, individual groups can quickly, in their OPEX budget, say, oh, let's sign up Mercatus. Mm -hmm. and they don't need to go through the IT infrastructure. I would, I would, argue, I would, argue, I would argue a different side. Just Mr. They're not Frank, losing... Me, let, oh, sorry. Sorry. I was saying more, we're seeing that more and more, where uh, clearly cloud SaaS-based models allow individual groups to kind of make quick decisions. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's right, but I'm mm -hmm. saying it is creating an internal tension between the two groups. Mm -hmm. If there's not an IT budget and they're standing in line yeah. because IT's got 10 other priorities, you know, an operating manager can say, you know what, I'm going to sign this. Out of my I don't budget. really need the IT infrastructure anymore. I can operate with Mercatus without IT infrastructure. Right. Interesting. What was your point? I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, what I was saying was I think for the first time ever they're able to sort of coexist, right? Mm -hmm. Because I think they've spoken different languages, you know, traditionally. One's coming in speaking Chinese, one's speaking One's wearing French. a suit and tie, the other's wearing a hoodie. Well, it's, it's just a matter of, look, technology is going to continue to drive innovation inside the, inside the environment. It's required. But unfortunately, it isn't necessarily just a three-year depreciation and out, right? Now if you can sort of 
be able to say, here's the price index and the optimal time to be able to do it, or move it along with technology, or move it to the cloud, whether that's private or public or hybrid, right? Now there's much more choices. So I think what we're, what we're seeing is, I agree, the shift in power and the balance is happening. Um, but what we're seeing is how to allow those groups between procurement, finance, which is really basically the same thing, and technology all coexist. You gotta have a unit of measure all the way around. Right. So talk about the challenges for each of your businesses. What are the challenges you're dealing with today, Arish? Uh, challenges in terms of our customers or challenges in terms of our, your, your our company? Our, our company challenges. You guys are all CEOs of your company. In another six hours, we can talk. <laughs> <laughs> Give me your top three that keep you up oh, at night. I think i got to lie down on a couch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh, uh, okay. Can we bring the beer in now? <laughs> <laughs> well, you've got uh, CEOs yeah, in the I'm audience. I'm sure they'll relate exactly. I, I think I describe our challenge. It's getting our customers to recognize that they have a problem. Mm -hmm. And it's really put a tremendous pressure in our sales organization Instead of asking the traditional question, what keeps you up at four in the morning, we're telling them this is what should keep you up at four in the morning. It's a subtle shift, yeah. but it's a very difficult transition to make to have that gumption to tell our customer that this is why you should be up in the morning. Yeah, I can believe that. How about you, Adam? I think our biggest challenge today is, is well, first of all, this is one of the first venues that UCX has been at to kind of introduce who we are. So we, I mean, our first challenge is to, to build awareness of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, I said, the, I think the second challenge is, is enterprises currently are working to understand, you know, what they're spending in IT. So there is a, I guess if, if you could say it, a marketplace enablement that needs to take place that moves them from step A where they're understanding their cost, they're understanding their consumption, to the next step of forecasting, then moving into being able to buy and sell and transact. So it's, it's moving the different companies were, and they're all at different points in, you know, on that, along that process. So moving those companies along uh, as efficiently and as quickly as possible. That's probably our biggest challenge. Mm -hmm. Frank? Um, I think it, the, the biggest problem is creating the awareness. Awareness, right? yeah, market awareness, it, which is marketing. Yeah, it, you know, and just being known, I mean, we're trading on five continents today. I mean, I'll be the small base, but there are no language barriers in any of the technology that, that's being traded. Um, so it's creating the awareness, but it's, it's creating distribution, right? There is really, really an important step of saying, how do we partner with the OEM? How do we partner with the enterprise? How do we partner with the colos, right? To create that awareness and create the distribution. So it's, it's probably just time mm -hmm. um, is, is usually the thing that, that keeps CEOs, I think, up at, up at night is just getting that through. We found product market fit. We're going to continue to execute against that, mm -hmm. um, but it's awareness. Oh, funding too. I, yeah, yeah. I would, I would say I, we're, we're going to get to that. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say. Look, you know, when, when as, a, I'm, as an entrepreneur, I'm a student of blue ocean strategy, and so you know, when, when you actually create a blue ocean, nobody ever tells you that you know the the downside to that is actually success failure, right? So, Six Fusions come along, and we've opened up a cabinet inside the enterprise that hasn't been open in a long time. We shine shine a light inside there. Um, and you know, at the end of the day, it's about keeping up. I mean, we can't, you know, scaling the organization, um, you know, uh, you know, raising the right amount of capital to have the proper balance sheet to do business with the likes of the companies we're doing business with. That's the kind of stuff that, at the end of the day, you know, you can, you can, um, you can almost, uh, you know, uh, uh, fail because of success. And so, making sure that that is that cadence um, is managed is probably the most difficult thing for us right now. Mm -hmm. And do your customers ask? Because I mean, we have. Uh, We've got, of the, all of you are raising capital. We have three Series Bs, one Series A uh, amongst you. And do your customers ask you about your balance sheets and, and the large worry ones about do. doing yeah. business? Yeah, the large ones do, absolutely. When you walk into you know, a large bank or you walk into you know, the, the largest uh, infrastructure as a service provider on, uh, in the market, you know, they, they want to know that you're going to be around next month. They want to know that, you know that, that this isn't a, um, you know, a fly-by-night type of, of operation because you know, they don't have time to invest, um, you know, in, in becoming partners uh, yep. in that kind of process. So, yeah, absolutely. It's about, it's about demonstrating um, longevity through capital base. Uh, it's, it's a very important thing to have. Basically, I would have expected more from mm -hmm. our customers to scrutinize. You say you would have expected more? I would more. expect more scrutiny. Yeah. I've been surprised how little. We've had only one customer, and just recently it was GE that we just closed. And GE was the first one that kind of said, we really need to see your balance sheet. We really need to see your financials. We want the details. And we said no. And they said yes. And we said no. And, but outside of that, we landed brands just as big <laughs> as they did without all that scrutiny. Mm -hmm. So um, we've been surprised. Mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the things that has helped us not probably get that question yet, 
than when we were still early on. You'll get so it. We'll get it. <laughs> yeah, wait for I it. Mean, we, we spent two and a half years negotiating with the, the largest you know, inter, uh, exchanges and having the support of the CME group kind of, you know, you got a big dog behind you a little bit. So that, right. that does help. Yeah. That, that does help. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's always about, you know, what's your balance sheet. The good thing as far as from our exchange is we're not taking principal risk, right? We're really right. just a connection point. So it's right. less about sort of the importance of do you have the capital to be able to move $100 million through. Right. Um, I think it would be more if, if, if there was a principal uh, position being, uh, you know, uh, by market X, but we're the neutral platform. So um, it is about leveraging others' uh, balance sheets as well and other partners be able to drive liquidity. Um, it always is going to come up, but it, I think the innovation and in what you provide can also sort of sway things, I think, in your favor. If it's, if it's a really good um, opportunity and possibility for them to be able to get a great return on invested capital, they're going to figure out a way to make it happen. Okay, so we have four exciting startup companies here. Three of them are raising uh, Series Bs, one Series A. So they'll be around if any of the investors in the audience want to chat with them. And I, I think we're going to move on to our next panel here. Cool. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.